to the online worship with St. Mary of the Angels. I'm Father Kevin, I'm the rector here, and I'm happy to have you with us this morning. If you are someone who has joined us for our online worship at any point in time over the last year, you would know that it's changed quite a bit and we continue to make changes. We have done pre-recorded services like this one right here, and we've also begun to try to start live streaming. We are going to continue to start live streaming, so later on today at 10 o'clock, we will have a live stream uh, option of our 10 o'clock service on our Facebook page, so please join us for that. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. We're going to continue to try to find ways to live stream, but we are also going to keep working on doing other options like this one as well. Now these ones are gonna be a little bit less formal than our full service. We obviously aren't gonna have the full order of worship that we do when we come together as Episcopalians in worship. Um, but this is mainly gonna be almost more like a, a short prayer and a chance to get through some scripture and sing a song or two. Uh, so I do want to encourage you to continue to be a part of this with us. Uh, this morning I am actually coming to you from inside our sanctuary. I am here alone at the moment. We are between our 8 o'clock and our 10 o'clock in-person services. You are more than welcome to join us for either one of those in person as well if you're comfortable and ready to be back out. Uh, we do still wear masks and we do still practice social distancing. But if you're looking for a safe, comfortable place to come and be in person with people, you have that option. You can also continue to get communion. Uh, we are doing communion in our services, but I'm also doing live, or not live, drive-through communion. Uh, or usually around 11.15 to 11.30ish, it, it depends on the service, but around 11.15, 11.30 uh, time in the morning, just outside in our parking lot, you can see me out there, I'm the tall, bald guy with the robe on and uh, I'm happy to give you communion even as you're sitting in your car driving by. So please do continue to join us for worship. Bear with us as we continue to try to figure out the best way for us to come together in person and online to be able to worship our Lord and share the love and light of Christ in this world. Not always something that is easy to do. So with that, as you see these changes, if you want to be a part of it, if you want to contribute or help with it, either by donating uh, materials or funds to help us to do this, if you have ideas or you know people who have good ideas for how to make this stuff happen, we, we are open to hear anything and everything we can that will help us further the mission and work of Christ in this world. So with that, thank you for joining us for worship this morning. I have our collect of the day. It is a prayer we use to begin our day, and I'm going to pray it with you right here, right now. I'm going to start by saying that I want God to be evident in your life. So I'm going to say, the Lord be with you. And I hope you want him evident in my life, so you say, and also with you. And I'm going to say, let us pray. O oh God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. I hope you can sing along with and enjoy this hymn. Oh, how bright the path. 
scripture we do multiple readings on a Sunday morning we usually have Old Testament and New Testament and Psalms and Gospels and this week is one of those weeks we actually have a couple New Testament readings and one of them is from the first letter of John uh, now things you need to know about the first letter of John for one church scholars or bi biblical scholars aren't all in agreement as to which John wrote these letters there are a few different options. There is John the baptizer, which we, were, we know it's not him because he had his head removed. Uh, you can read through that as well in other parts of the scripture. So we know it's not John the baptizer, but there was John, the uh, Jesus's beloved disciple. There's also another John that it could have possibly been that came later. There's a few options. A lot of people tend to think it might be John the beloved. Um, I lean with them, but I'm not sure yet. Now, here's something interesting. There's three letters of John, and the second one and third one let us know who wrote them. The first one doesn't. The first one is anonymous. So how do we know that it's John? Well, when you look at the second letter and the third letter, it's very clear that this one is kind of an introduction to the topics covered in those letters. And you can see that whoever wrote it is incredibly similar stylistically to the person who wrote the second and third letters. So when, when you see with writers, just like fingerprints or, or different patterns of speech, you know, comedians like to make fun of uh, presidents and senators because they have certain patterns of speech. So it's kind of the same thing. You learn about a writer and you can see a lot of similarities in how they write. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we're really certain that this was written by the same John that wrote the Gospel of John. And the reason for that is he uses a lot of the same structure and techniques in what he's writing. One of the things that he does is he is very much poetic and he uses rhetoric and styles of kind of like uh, helping to inform people. If you look at, at the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, those are very straightforward. They're very just cut and dry. This is what happened. They're orderly. Luke even goes on to say, I'm going to write an orderly account. John's a little bit more interested in the meaning behind everything than he is things being orderly. So he writes in that way. And because of that, he's a little bit prone to hyperbole. He's a little bit prone to not exaggerate the truth, but to amplify it, to make it Bigger. There's actually a technique uh, called amplification where you're taking things and making it bigger and, and a little bit more grand than what you might just simply be saying. Uh, in fact, I don't recommend it often. There is a version of the Bible called the Amplified Bible, and it really is kind of like the adjective Bible because it throws in a whole lot of adjectives. If there's a scripture that says, and uh, God created the earth and saw that it was good and said that it was good. The Amplified Bible would say, and God created all that was the earth and saw in its fantasticness that it was amazingly good. And he said, wow, this is so amazingly good. Like it does that where it takes the scripture and it just amplifies it. Well, that's kind of what John does. So when we get to John, the first letter of John, chapter three, verses one through seven, we're going to hear this. See what the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when He is revealed, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is, and all who have this hope in Him purify themselves just 
as he is pure. Everyone, and here's where it gets a little tricky, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. So that's first letter of John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. And when I read through this, uh, you definitely, there's, there's traces of hyperbole in there. And there's a few verses that confuse me uh, upon the first reading. And the verses are really kind of verse 6. Verse 6 says this, No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Now the him it's talking about is Jesus. And it's saying no one who abides in Jesus sins. And then it says, so if you're sinning, then you don't know him or you don't abide in him. And that's a little hard to hear because how many Christians do you know who know Jesus and abide in him or try to, and yet they do still suffer and struggle with sin. So it kind of makes it seem like if you're sinning, then you just, you're not a good enough Christian yet. And that's not what it's saying. In fact, he says quite the opposite in the first chapter of the book. Uh, he goes on to say quite a bunch of other things that are far more uh, open. And he says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So right there he says, yeah, we have sin. Uh, so it seems like they con contradict each other. And then he gives us the tool to our sin. Uh, if we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So it's like, if we say we haven't sinned, then we're lying, which is sinful, and we're making him a liar because sin's not in him. But then it goes on in chapter 3 to say, anyone who's with him or abides in him or knows him doesn't sin. Ah, it's confusing. So here's what you need to know. John is writing this letter to a church. And it's a new church that's trying to figure out what it's going to do. They have got, they're made up mostly of Jews in this particular church that John is writing to. And these Jews are righteous Jews who have been waiting for the Messiah for years. And they have been practicing the laws and the rules and the regulations and, and the practices of Judaism. And they have thousands of years of history and tradition in their Jewish church that is now trying to figure out how to be Christian. They're trying to figure out there's something new happening, there's something different happening, and it seems very different than what we knew before, but in a way it's similar. So, so that's kind of the place this church is in. These new churches, they're small churches. They're not like this place. They're actually home churches, so they're people meeting in their homes in small groups, and they're trying to figure out who is this Jesus guy? What is he doing? What, or what has he done? Uh, what is his connection to God? What is his connection to us? And how do we worship him in light of all that we have done and all that we are now learning? That's a hard thing to do. So while they're doing it, there are other people who are starting to show up and they're starting to share their thoughts and their ideas, but their thoughts and their ideas are not exactly based upon the truth of who and what Jesus is. There are those who have the idea that Jesus is a ghost, that he is not actually a physical person, that he is only a spiritual person, that in a way it's like God sending down an angel or an apparition of himself to us, but not actually physically here with us. Because all the stuff that Jesus does, they're having a hard time wrapping their brain around it and saying that's the only way it makes sense. God cannot be human. Well, John is trying to tell these people, don't listen to them, they're wrong. That Jesus was very much human. His disciples reached out and touched him and put their hands in his wounds. Uh, and they walked with him before he was crucified and after he was resurrected. This whole idea of him being an apparition is false, don't follow it. So John is uh, talking to a church who has all these new people joining in with their own ideas and these people are trying to steer them in the wrong direction. And John's trying to address that. He's trying to uh, 
help them to understand the truth in the right direction. Now that is mostly taking place in letter two and three. Letter one is damage control. Have you ever had to do damage control? Has anybody ever said something they shouldn't have said or done, and you or you've said or done something you shouldn't have said or done, and now you're trying to fix it? And a lot of us aren't good at that. A lot of us, there are so many times in my life where I say the wrong thing to my wife or another loved one, and I try to get myself out of trouble by talking too much, and what I'm really doing is digging a deeper hole, trying to get myself out, and they look at me and they say, Kevin, Kevin, stop digging, you're making it worse, but I keep on digging. So John is kind of trying to do damage control. He's trying to write a letter, and he's not as focused in the letter on being like Matthew or Luke and saying, okay, here's what you need to know. Here's what happened, this and this and this. His first part of this letter is basically trying to encourage them to say, okay, I understand things are going a little bit weird here, and I'm going to get to that. We'll, we'll get to the details, but first I wanna just encourage you all, let you know the good that's going on, let you know don't worry too much about the bad. He's, he's trying to, to help them, and he's trying to get them back into a good place of feeling confident in their faith and what it is they're doing. So he's writing this letter in a way to say, don't listen to them, don't worry about that, that's fine. We need to focus on you and what you believe and what you know to be true and what we know to be true and the evidence of that here. And I'll tell you what the evidence is, but for right now, you just need to know the very basic thing, which is so forth and so on. And that's where we get the things along the lines of, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the word is not in us. And when John refers to the word, he is referring to God. He starts his gospel with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John sees the Word as being both Father and Son, God in one, and the word that he uses is the Word to represent that. So when we read this, and we go back and read the first seven verses of chapter 3, we can recognize when you know it's damage control, trying to kind of like help in this harsh situation that's taking place and trying to just get people in a good place of feeling all right about things so that they can then get into the order and the, the logistics of it. When you read it again under that understanding, listen to it and see if it might make more sense. And also that's, that's where hyperbole comes in too, uh, is you, you tend to be over energetic or emphasize a little greater when you're trying to encourage people. So uh, that's what happens here. So I'm going to read it again. See what the, the, sorry, see what love the Father has for us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is that when he is revealed, we will be like him. When he is revealed, we will be like him. For we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Now understand, there's a word that happens there. He says, those who, uh, I'll go back, those, all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. There's a difference between purify and pure. And that's important to this passage because purify is talking about a state of action. Purify is a journey. It is, you're not there yet, but you're working on it. Purifying is a process. So he says, those who have hope in him purify themselves. They're in the process of getting better, getting away from sinfulness, just as he is pure. He's not in the process. He's already there. And we're trying to get there through him. So then he goes on, everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. All those people who are sinning, who are trying to tell you what to do, there's lawlessness there. You know what he has, that he has revealed. You know that he was revealed to take away sins. And in him, there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Now again, right here, it's remembering, it's that process that if you're sinning, it doesn't mean you don't know Christ. It just means you don't yet know him fully. It doesn't mean you don't abide fully in him. You just haven't gotten there fully. You are still in that process 
of becoming what he is, which is sin free. And we may never reach that process in our lifetimes, though we can strive for it. God doesn't ever say, I'm going to free you of your sins so you don't have to do anything about it. I would think he actually does encourage us to try. I mean, he says, go and repent, turn away from your wicked ways, turn away from your sinfulness. So we are called to try to be sin free. But knowing that we are in a process and if or when we fail, it doesn't mean he doesn't love us and it doesn't mean we don't love him. We're still in that process, but we keep moving forward. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. John doubles down on the new commandment that Christ has given us, which really isn't a new commandment. It's, it's kind of the basis behind all of the commandments we had ever received. John is doubling down on what Jesus has said at the Last Supper, which is this, love your neighbors as I have loved you. Love God, love your neighbors. Serve others as I am serving you. Those who do what is right are righteous. Those who do not are not just as he is righteous. There's a lot of encouragement in the first letter of John. There's confusion too, but we have to remember he's, he's doing damage control. And, and isn't it strange because such a part of our lives is damage control. I, I would think a huge chunk, a, a vast uh, majority of my life has been damage control, helping others through their damage helping myself or letting others help me through my damage. We, there, there's damage in our lives. There are parts that are broken, parts that are hurt, parts that are dirty, parts that don't work well. And with that, we've got to try to do what we can to, to repair it and to fix it and recognizing that the great physician, maintainer, maintenance man in the sky, if you will, to give just a, a terrible thought of, of who God is. He's so much greater than that. But we are called to work towards damage control. And part of that as a Christian body is us helping others, not by judging them, not by telling them how they're wrong from a place that, here's the, the key. Everything we do must begin and end with love, not self-righteousness, not uh, the triumph of our own morality, and definitely not by having God do what we would have him do, but instead us submitting ourselves to do what he would have us do. So many people read the scripture and they read it trying to get it to say what they want. And they read it trying to get God to agree with them. Our job is not to get God to agree with us. It's for us to learn to agree with him. And what he tells us to do is to openly love each other. And if we do that, then we are in that process of purifying ourselves just as he is pure. No ulterior motives, just pure love. I want to pray, and I want you to pray with me. You don't have to say anything, but you can. I won't hear you, so it's okay. And even if I did, I'd be fine with it. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the message, for John's letters to his church, or to your church, really. And for the challenges that they faced, Lord, let us learn from their example to recognize that the church is so much more than we see it as, and yet we do so little with it from so many times. Help us to truly work to become your church, to realize that sanctification, purification is a process, and it is a process that we are all on, that we are all dealing with damages in our lives, and our job is to let love be the guide, the gauze, the balm, whatever it takes to help heal the wounds, to mend the broken, and to help this world become what you created it to be, a world of loving relationship with each other and you. We pray this in your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please do enjoy this hymn. tongues to sing my great redeemer's praise 
The glories of my God and King, the trials of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth and broad the honors of Thy name. breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the fathers clean. His blood avail for me. He speaks in listening to his voice. New life the dead receive. The mournful broken not rejoice, the humble poor believe. Look unto him, ye nations own, your God, ye fallen race. Look can be saved through faith alone. Be Justified by grace See all your sins on Jesus laid The Lamb of God was slain His soul was once and often made For every soul in pain My great Redeemer's praise The glories of my God and King The triumphs of His grace I hope you enjoyed this little mini worship thing we had going on this morning. This is what Sunday morning pre-recorded worship at 915 is going to look like. We will have our live stream at 10 o'clock and that will continue to develop as well. So please uh, keep reaching out and joining us. We also have a Tuesday night Bible study taking place right now only online. What it is, is Adamir, who is now kind of a, my pastoral assistant, I guess is the best way to describe him. He's, he's really a catch-all around here, but such an amazing, brilliant young man who has such a heart and the wisdom that God has given him is a gift. And he's sharing that with us on Tuesday nights. So what you basically do is at 6.30, there's a video that is playing on Tuesday nights uh, that Adamir is sharing with us. And then at seven o'clock, we all meet online again to have a conversation to just kind of go over that topic. Uh, the videos will be available on YouTube and Facebook. And then the online conversation, we use Zoom. If you'd like to be a part of that, you can just find us on Facebook or YouTube and we'll figure out how to tell you where to go from there. Or email the church. Email us. The email address is info, that is I-N-F-O, at stmaryangels.org. It is I-N-F-O at S-T-M-A-R-Y-A-N-G-E-L-S dot O -R -G. And it's really important that you do St. Mary Angels and not St. Mary Angles. Uh, it's E-L, not L-E. I make that mistake all the time. Uh, so you're not alone if you do too. Email us 
And on Tuesday, we will send you an email with the links. So all you gotta do is open the email and it says, for the video, click here, and you click here. And it says, for the Zoom discussion, click here, and you click here, and we will do everything we can. We have, we'll have a phone number in the email for technical help if you need it, but please do join us with that. I hope you have a blessed week. I hope that God answers all of your prayers uh, and that you are fully aware of Him in your life. And until I see you again, may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.